Hey, Mr. Widmer here from Mr. Widmer's History. Welcome to Unit 8, The Roaring Twenties, or The Decade of Normalcy, 1920 to 1928. 8.1, we're going to assess the presidency of Warren G. Harding by examining his politics. Our 1920s, what are the 1920s all about, do you ask? Well, they're often called the Decade of Normalcy, the Roaring Twenties, the Jazz Age. We had widespread social and economic change during this decade. We had much prosperity, unless you're a farmer, because we had increased consumer borrowing and spending, which will hurt us later on, say, in 1929, when the Great Depression. And the Decade of Change. We had science versus religion, traditionalist versus modernity, racism, scandal, Prohibition, Renaissance. Are you ready? Here we go. First up, we're going to look at the election of 1920. Now, the election of 1920 uh, between Harding and Cox. Okay, Harding with Coolidge and Cox with FDR. And the key issue with League of Nations. Are we going to join the League of Nations, uh, which we created, uh, or are we going to stay away from the League of Nations and not join them? So that's the key issue. Uh, the big thing was Harding was like, uh, we're not joining the League of Nations. And so, yeah, you guessed it, he's going to win the election. Overwhelmingly going to win this election. All right, his campaign slogan was a return to normalcy. We're going to return to the way things were prior to World War One, when things were good, things were better. Okay, that's what he promised to the American public, the American people. As you see, election map pretty much destroyed. All right, you still have the solid Democratic South here. The Solid South, which you'll see continue. Uh, Harding, the Republican, he's just going to win almost everything. So, all right, what are we going to do post war foreign policy? What are we going to do? Well, Harding, like you said, he vowed not to join the League of Nations, and we're not going to join the League of Nations. And the U.S. is way too powerful and too economically interconnected and too widely involved in world affairs to really turn to isolationism. Uh, we are going to be uh, neutral. All right, we do not want to go to war or trade with countries at war. And so we're going to try hard to be isolationist, neutral, but it's going to be hard to do. A right, major problem was, well, $10.3 billion war debt that the Allies owed the U.S. Yeah, we were owed $10.3 billion from World War One. And they had a hard time paying this debt. They tried to justify themselves and not pay. And the U.S. argued that they received territory, you got reparations, and what did we get? Uh, diddly squat, zero nothing. So you better be paying up. But the U.S. being the kind nation that we are, uh, we made deals with these nations to reduce their debt by 30 to up to 80%. That's a big deal. All right. After all the money they owe us, $2.3 billion, we're going to help them reduce the debt by 80%. That's pretty great. All right, most of the money the Allies paid came from Germany. I mean, Germany obtained private bank loans to pay for reparations, uh, especially from the U.S. It's called the Dawes Plan. So Germany flat broke here. Uh, we're going to loan Germany money so Germany can pay France and Great Britain, so France and Great Britain can pay us. So basically, we're paying ourselves back. All right, but then we'll get money later on from Germany and, and uh, with the loans and uh, you know interest rates. But kind of the triangle here, the Dawes plan. We loan Germany money. Germany pays Great Britain and France. Great Britain and France pays us. Okay, it's the triangle going on. All right, and next up we have this Washington Naval Conferences. We need to do something about the rising navies and uh, the cost and the rising power. Uh, in the Pacific, Japan, we're going to do something about this. So we're going to have these Washington Naval Conferences to try to figure out what we're going to do. So Great Britain and Japan are building up their navies. Uh, the U.S. is worried about this. We're going to hold this, like I said, we're going to hold this uh, conference to keep this in check. All right, the first conference, we're going to have a four-power treaty. All right, an agreement between the U.S., Great Britain, and France, and Japan uh, agreed to restrict each other's Pacific holdings. We're... All right, we're not going to build any more Pacific holdings. We're going to kind of like stay status quo where we are. And so we're, we're holding back uh, the rise in, of powers in specifically Japan. You know, basically a lot of this is about restricting the rise of Japan. All right, the five-power treaty, we're going to add Italy into this mix. 
Right? And this uh, was created to avoid the financial strains going on in building new navies. And the arms race was if one country builds a navy, then we got to build up our navy. And then another country have to build up their navy. And just, you know, this goes on and on. And we can't keep this up because Europe is, you know, really bad shape right now after World War One, And so building this up is not good. So we're going to halt uh, large warships for 10 years. Can't build a large warship for 10 years. You can build small ships, but you can't build as large, uh, you know, destroyers. Um, the U.S. and Great Britain would not build any new mail bases in the Pacific. That's Japan's wish. They didn't want us involved in the Pacific because they had greater plans of their own. And Japan agreed to remain inferior. If we stay out of their business, uh, then they won't grow exponentially. That's what they say, anyways. All right, and then we're going to make another one, Nine Power Treaty. We're going to add some more. Okay, this is all about equal opportunity in China, the Nine Power Treaty. We're going to preserve the open door, we're going to get all these nations involved, and we're going to have equal commercial rights in China. So, Nine Power Treaty, a.k.a. Equal Opportunity in China. Right, so, the conference was initial success, but it failed to limit the military forces on land. It didn't say anything about it. you can't build up an army. And so, countries, instead of building up a navy, they use their resources to build up an army. And so, navies could still build an unlimited amount of small vessels, like I said. I quick review part one, uh, Harding won the election 29, vying to not join the League of Nations, uh, return to normalcy, allies owed 10.3 billion, should be a billion there, uh, to the U.S., the U.S. is very lenient towards the allies in the area reducing amount owed, the Dawes plan, uh, Washington Naval Conference is going to reduce the size of the Navy worldwide, and with the Washington Conference called Brand Pact, uh, that we'll talk about later, the U.S. wants to maintain peace through international uh, agreements. All right, business as normalcy, Harding's very laissez-faire. All right, let people do what they want. Let businesses do what they want. Kind of hands off. Okay, Harden's very hands off. All right, laissez-faire. We're going to uh, raise tariffs. Uh, we're going to create a way to lower and regulate the national debt. All right, we're going to lower taxes. National debt was reduced by $8 billion. All right, between 1921 and 1929, today, that'd be some great. $8 billion to lose debt. All right, Andrew Mellon, Secretary of the Treasury, he's going to introduce trickle-down economics where you pump uh, stimulus money into corporations, big business, government, and all that will trickle down to the rest of the country. All right, trickle-down economics. That's what Andrew Mellon, he introduced this. Hardy was the first president to do that. Then Hoover does it. Really got popular with uh, Ronald Reagan in the 80s with the Reaganomics. And so, but really started here, Andrew Mellon, uh, and, you know, pump it all up top, and it'll trickle down to the rest of the country. All right, labor unions had a hard time. Uh, technological unemployment, people losing jobs all the time because of new technology. You know, musicians got out of work, and you know, it was a really hard time. And so, labor unions going to face a hard time because of immigration, and also because of uh, increased government dislike of unions. And so labor unions decline in strength. Employee, employers want to open shop where you can work in this factory without being part of the union. All right, well, for capitalism, system make employees feel more parts. So here we go. People are going to be able to buy stock in a, co in a company. All right, so the first time their ordinary people can buy stock in a company. And so now you can buy stock and the company you work. So you feel like you own a part of it. You feel more in, endowed to help your company out because you have a stake in it. Uh, the government, during strikes, they're usually going to side with the employers. I mean, that's just what's going to happen. All right, turn General Doherty, uh, help break railroad and coal strikes, prohibiting union activity. Unions weren't doing very well during the 1920s, okay? Court injunctions, freely used stop strikes and boycotts. Just like I said, wasn't going very well. And on top of that, we're going to do strict immigration, okay? The United States becomes very xenophobic, all right? We are very scared of change. We're very scared of different. And so when people come over here that are different, have a different religion, uh, you know, different way of life, different kind of government, we're scared, you know, especially with the, you know, the Red Scare going on after World War I, uh, we're afraid threat of uh, threat of communism, and so xenophobia just runs rampant. Nativism is on the rise. All right, it's going to slow down a rise in immigration. Congress is going to act. People are going to act, and it doesn't turn out well. 
All right, most immigrants are going to move to big cities like uh, New York City and Chicago. Uh, people feared immigrants would overthrow traditional project values. We didn't like it. The labor unions didn't like immigrants because they're willing to work for cheap. And so, you know, it really, you know, disagrees with what labor unions uh, want better wages, better hours, and everything. It's like, well, why are we going to give you this if we can just hire this immigrant to work for none of that? All right. So, Congress gets involved. 1921, Harding signed the Emergency Quota Act, uh, which cut the number of people in many of the United States. We're going to keep that going. Immigration Act, 1924. Uh, many restrictions of permanent policy. Basically, we get to pick and choose who comes into America. All right, we don't want you know, especially like more uh, Japanese. We don't want them coming in America. Any people from Africa. We're kind of restricting, we're kind of picking and choosing who comes to America by setting you know Western Europe. Many people Western Europe, they're like us, so they can come anytime they want. So their quota is high. But the quota, the amount of people can come from. Uh, Southern, Eastern Europe, Asia, that's really low. And so, very important act, Immigration Act 1924, is very, very important. We're going to restrict, basically pick and choose who comes into this country. All right, KKK, and then a rise. Changing 100% Americanism. All right, white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism. And KKK, very big this time. Uh, then we have the Palmer Rage, where Attorney General... Uh, Mitchell Palmer is going to basically go on a witch hunt for anybody that could be a threat to the government. So this really threatens civil rights and civil liberties of the people of the nation. And he's deport communists, socialists, and anyone who would cause any kind of problems to the government. Uh, we're going to deport. Okay, Mitchell Palmer. As you see here, uh, you got Palmer here, and he's rallying up everybody who may pose a threat. To America, he did this because he wanted to become president one day. And he thought this would help his campaign, uh, get his name out there, but really it hindered it. And you know, because of this, he was never president. All right, big thing here: Sacco and Vanzetti. This is really the the pinnacle of nativism, pinnacle of anti-immigration in America. All right, they broke in. Uh, they accuse of killing two men, and because they're immigrants, because they're Italian immigrants, they did not get a fair trial, and so they end up electrocuted uh, in 1927 because main view because they're immigrants. Okay, if they were a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, American-born, they probably would have got a fair trial and found out that they didn't kill the man. You know, they they were part of the robbery over there, uh, but. Since they were were uh, immigrants, they uh, you know did not receive a fair trial. And it's like I said, the height of xenophobia, the height of nativism, really comes into fruition with Sacco and Vanzetti. A very, very, very important case. Remember that. Watch the video here uh, on the YouTube channel. A right, quick review: Harding's economic policies is laissez-faire. Raise tariffs, lower taxes, reduce the national debt, trickle down economics. U.S. restricted immigration in the 1920s. The rise of nativism occurred. None more evident than the Sacco and Vanzetti trial, where two men did not receive a fair trial and were executed mainly because they were immigrants. The rise of KKK, the Red Scare, the Palmer Raids, all indications of xenophobia going on. Now, Warren G. Harden is going to be one of the most scandalous presidencies ever. All right, he's just it's just mired with scandal. All right, one was corrupted, and pretty because of his Ohio gang. These are basically his friends who used, you know, hey, I know the president, and they use his name to get ahead in life. And so the Ohio gang uh, used their ties to the president to sell appointments, pardons, immunity, you know, all those things. Really bad. Uh, the worst was. The Teapot Dome scandal, where Albert Falls is going to sell government land to private businesses uh, so they can get oil off the land. Okay, Teapot Dome scandal. Right, so, Albert Fall eventually went to prison for this. Uh, Harding stated he had more trouble with his friends than he did with his enemies. Right, Harvard, Harding died in San Francisco in 1923 from brain aneurysm, uh, maybe heart attack, stroke. No one really knows for sure, but that's when he died in 23. Alright, so quick lesson review. Until next time, study history.